Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast, where today we're talking about wind. And specifically, we're asking if 40% of our power here in the UK comes from renewable sources, why is it that the price of that electricity is dictated by gas 98% of the time? How do we move to a world in which we get to feel the benefits of lovely, cheap, clean grid scale energy reflected in our bills? Well, very shortly, I'm going to be joined by Anna Musart, who is the Executive Director of Policy and Engagement at Renewable UK. But before we get to her, I have three very, very quick things to tell you. First of all, I should tell you that my name is Imogen Vogel. I am one of the presenters and producers here on the Fully Charged Show and the Everything Electric Show. So I spend most of my time hanging out on our YouTube channels, which, whilst of course I am biased, I highly recommend that you go and check those out once you've had a windy foray into the world of renewable energy. And secondly, I have to tell you about our live shows. Next up, we're in Harrogate, uh, where you can come and join us for some fabulous EV test drives to hear from some incredible speakers, to see all the latest and greatest in clean energy technology, and of course, speak to the experts to find out what you need to do, regardless of where you may be in your own personal clean energy transition. And of course, we get to meet you, which is wonderful because uh, it's always good to hear from our lovely listeners and viewers to find out what you care about, really. Um, and all of the important details are in the description below. And the third thing, I think this conversation warrants a bit of a caveat. And the reason being is that I would say on the Fully Charged show, we are reasonably informed. We are literally paid to talk about renewable energy and clean energy technologies and electric vehicles. We spend our time immersed in this world. And yet for me, what this podcast brought out was some of my biases, assumptions, and a little bit of my ignorance. And I think that's precisely why these kind of long form discussions are valuable. Anna is an incredible lady whose knowledge is just exceptional. I learned so much from this podcast and I really hope that you do too. Please do let us know what you think in the comments and um, give us a like and a subscribe whilst you're there. Let's meet Anna. Like everything electric? You'll love our fun packed everything electric expos around the world. Next up, we're in Harrogate and Vancouver. Remember, energy and transport professionals go for free on the first day. Anna, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I am really acutely aware that this is possibly a very selfish ploy for myself to learn much more about energy economics. So I really thank our audience for bearing with me on this one because I have so many questions. Um, so looking forward to this quest. But to kick us off, can you just start by telling us what is Renewable UK? Yeah, of course. So Renewable UK is the trade association for renewable energy. Uh, we bring together nearly 500 companies and institutions to effectively help deliver the energy transition. So we have members uh, that are renewable generators across all types of renewable technologies. So offshore wind, onshore wind, green hydrogen, storage and flexibility. But actually about half of our members are in the supply chain. So that's uh, looking at manufacturing of key components for renewables. It's looking at services, installations, ports and vessels operators that in, uh, help us install turbines out at sea. So quite a diverse membership. And we have a team of just over 60 brilliant people located across the UK who work really closely with our members to ensure that we can build a decarbonized, affordable and reliable energy system of the future. And I guess... You know, obviously, we're working towards that um, completely net zero grid. But what are kind of the specific goals and priorities, I guess, within the next sort of five years or so? Yeah, so I think for, for us at Renewable UK, as, as I said, we want to build a future energy system powered by, by renewable energy. That could sound straightforward, but it's actually uh, involved. It involves quite a lot of elements. So I think if we're looking at the near future, the first one is about ensuring that we have the adequate market signals in place to enable us to deploy a range of technologies and build a future system that is reliable. I'm sure we're going to come back to this because there's been uh, some announcements to this end today. The second point is around building the right infrastructure. So it's not just the turbines and the electrolyzers to, uh, to produce green hydrogen, but it's also about reinforcing the grid, ensuring that we have the right transmission system in place uh, to be able to move this power around the country, uh, but also expanding our ports, expanding our factories, because we're now looking at much bigger turbines, much bigger blades. So uh, we really need to consider that expansion as well. 
And finally, I just wanted to make the point around ensuring that we make a good case for um, for the sector, with the public, but also with the politicians, because all of this uh, ne needs to have public support and we need to bring the public along with us. Um, we have a lot of work that we're doing in communities to build this infrastructure. So it's really essential that they're, uh, they're brought on board. Um, and I should mention that the news to which you refer to is the fact that we woke up this morning to the announcement that the UK government are backing new gas plants. And we were chatting before we uh, we clicked record, and I was saying that you know I'm a diehard Radio Four fan. Uh, Radio Four comes on in the morning, and I was as I was dozing, there was this news around government backs new gas plant, and I was thinking, well, I'm obviously dreaming because I'm thinking about this podcast, and then woke up to that reality. You think, oh my goodness, uh, a that's very timely for this conversation, but b lots and lots to unpick there. So we will come back to that. And I'm also very grateful that you've still found time for this podcast because your day just got extremely busy with that news. Um, but in terms of kind of your specific role, where do you fit into the Renewable UK uh, puzzle and what do you specifically look after? Sure. So I'm the executive director for policy and engagement. So my role is effectively focused on ensuring that we have the right uh, framework of rules in place to enable us to build this system quickly and cost effectively. And the engagement part of the role is about talking to government, talking to businesses and all the key stakeholders about the benefits of the sector, how we can get more private investment into UK renewables and what government, uh, what role government plays as part of that. So I, I've mentioned the upcoming election uh, briefly. Then you can imagine this is something that keeps us really, really busy because it's a really pivotal year for the sector. We have only six years left to deliver, deliver that 50 gigawatt target for offshore wind that uh, the government has set out. And we're seeing many headwinds to deployment that, that need to be overcome. There are a lot of ongoing reforms uh, that we're talking to government about at, at, mo at the moment around streamlining the planning system, around build, uh, accelerating the grid build out and rethinking the market fundamentals. But I'm really conscious that whenever a new government comes in, they've got their entry full of a, a bunch of different priorities from right across the economy. And so there's always the risk that important uh, reforms that we need to see in the sector are put on the back burner or they delayed quite a bit. And then effectively, this delays the, the investment that we need to see. So part of my job and the work that I'm doing with the team is really ensuring that doesn't happen, uh, that we keep this really at the top of the government's agenda and that they press on with the reforms that we need to unlock billions of private investment. My goodness. So, you know, easy job. <laughs> and what I imagine, and I think this is the really interesting thing about the job that we do on a fully charged side is that, you know, we have this helicopter view of loads of different industries and it means that we kind of can have to work quite hard to imagine what your day-to-day -day looks like and in my head having sort of heard you describe that I'm like you're just there being like right come on we've spoken about this this is what we need please can you kind of not forget that information it's really critical regardless of which side of the political spectrum you sit on um but in terms of that kind of 50 gigawatt target by 2030 um where where are we currently um, and how far are we on the right trajectory to meet that goal if nothing changed? Yeah, so I think you'll, you, you'll hear a lot of politicians talking about how we're doing really well and we're ahead of uh, many competitors. To a certain extent, that's right. Obviously, we've installed capacity much faster than our European competitors and we're doing pretty well when it comes to deployment. In terms of offshore wind installed in the UK, uh, we have uh, just over 14 gigawatts installed out of that 50 gigawatt target. So you can imagine it's still quite a, uh, a lot further to go. And um, on, on onshore wind, we've actually recently hit a milestone of 15 uh, gigawatts, uh, which are fully operational across the UK. So that's enough to power about 9.9 .9 million uh, homes year round just from that offshore wind capacity double that if you take into account on, uh, offshore wind. But I would say in terms of whether we're on the right track, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. So uh, I've mentioned we have 14 gigawatts of offshore wind. That means that we still need to deploy 36 gigawatts by 2030. So uh, the speed of deployment really needs to pick up. Um, in terms of onshore wind, again, it's one of our form is che uh, cheapest forms of generation, but it still faces a de facto ban in, in England. So it, you, effectively, you can't build, even if the communities are supportive, there are a range of different constraints in place, which makes it really difficult to deploy. So we need to change this because actually we want to enable those communities to make the right decisions for them, give them access to cheaper bills and also deploy the capacity that we need to get us closer to our targets. I should also say that 
compared to when we first started building uh, this industry and installing um, renewables, back then we were operating in a much less competitive market. So we were one of the first movers uh, and we actually uh, could could take a bit of time thinking about how we uh, how we develop these reforms. But now, actually, if you look at what's happening around the world, we have the US, uh, we have the EU, China, and a range of other countries across the Middle East that are putting in place some really serious investment uh, incentive packages to attract this investment. So we really can't just rest on our, our laurels and we need to be very mindful of that competitive environment. Uh, but actually, I would say, in terms of whether we're on the right track, my main concerns is around, is around the supply chain uh, and, and the skills. We know that everyone wants to deploy more, uh, but the supply chains are already constrained and they're really not scaling up quickly enough. Um, there's a figure from Wood McKenzie that says that the global offshore wind supply chain will require about $27 billion of, of investment by 2026 to meet the five-fold growth in annual installations uh, that is predicted around the world by 2030. So, you know, we always talk about these targets, and I think the last COP also talked about tripling the capacity of renewables. All of that is great, but yeah, one of my concerns is uh, where's the supply chain going to come from? Uh, so that's one of the key things that we need to focus on. And so one of the things that I'm guessing is that a big part of the supply chain is concentrated in China, as is the case for many renewable energy technologies. Is that the reality and what's currently the biggest bottleneck in deploying that supply chain? Yeah, so a, a part of it is definitely located in China, but uh, we actually have uh, really important parts of the supply chain here in the UK. So if we look at offshore wind, um, we have uh, blade facilities in the UK. Uh, we also manufacture cables here. And actually, we're really strong on the services point. So, uh, you know, environmental services, um, operations, maintenance, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's actually not that we're relying on a supply chain that is coming exclusively from, from other geographies. Um, I think we really need to be realistic about what we can build here and what we're going to need to buy because every country is now uh, at this uh, at this juncture where they're thinking about how to uh, reshore manufacturing, how to bring more of the supply chain uh, within uh, within their shores. But actually, you know, some some countries are good at some things, some countries are good at other things. Uh, we know that in the UK we've got a competitive advantage in some of the areas that I mentioned. So blades, cables, services, uh, electrical services as well. Um, we're much better off focusing on those and then thinking about how do we leverage partnerships with European neighbours, with the US, uh, and rely on some of those international supply chains as well. So I think there's a, there's a really important opportunity there. And I think we've done some analysis that shows if we invest in the supply chain, uh, we can create a GVA of about 92 billion pounds uh, by 20, 2040 by just investing in the supply chain. So it's a huge economic proposition. We just need to take it seriously and really accelerate deployment because you're not going to get the supply chain without the pipeline. And so is that the risk that at the moment it's not necessarily being taken seriously or there isn't that recognition that this is where our real hub of expertise lies? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a mixture of, of bottlenecks, right? I think um, part of it is the fact that we're not deploying quickly enough, and we're not deploying uh, constant volumes year on year. And I think if you're if you're an investor thinking about building a blade factory here, uh, you need to think, well, can I service most of the market uh, from from the UK? Part of it is going to be the UK market. Part of it is going to be the European market. But actually, in terms of the capacity that's come online year on year, uh, we don't see it ramping up as quickly as it should be. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about the unsuccessful offshore wind auction mm -hmm. later on. But, you know, that was a uh, that was a pretty damaging signal for the market. It's not a loss. Obviously, we can we can still get back on track. And as I've mentioned, we're not starting from scratch. Uh, but I think we really need to consider how we deploy predictable volumes each year to encourage that supply chain deployment. And I think the other risk is always just trying to do everything and then not really achieving mm. anything. Um, so there are many parts of the supply chain that can sound really attractive. Uh, you know, we could be looking to manufacture all the different components that go to, into a wind farm, uh, all the vessels, everything that it takes to install uh, a wind farm out at sea. But actually it's thinking about that unique value proposition and considering what are we really good at can we build on existing expertise? Because obviously that investment is going to happen faster. Mm. So there's a few things. Okay. And this is kind of where we're going to go into, we're going to open up Pandora's box. And I hope, <laughs> I hope I don't take us down too many obscure rabbit holes, but a couple of things that we sort of mentioned there, there is the de facto ban on onshore wind, which seems absolutely crazy. And especially when you hear all of the things around community wind farms and people asking for this stuff and the mechanisms presumably not existing to support them in a particularly easy way 
Secondly, how we kind of concentrate that supply chain. And then the thing that I think, and this is where we're going to Pandora's box, um, around how these things are actually funded and how I think that trickles down to the rest of the supply chain. Okay, I want to see if I've got this right. At the top of this podcast, we said that generating generating electricity from renewable sources, such as wind in this instance, is cheap. But the capex or the cost of building these projects initially is pretty expensive and more so because of our delightful interest rates. Um, And yet at the same time, the cost of electricity is dictated by the cost of gas, or at least 98% of the time it's dictated by the cost of gas, which follows a much more traditional supply and demand commodity trading type economics, which doesn't necessarily translate to wind in the same way. And the consequence of all of that is that we don't necessarily see the the benefits of cheap generation reflected in our electricity bills. And that's what I want to understand and kind of unpick and untangle. So I guess as a starting point, how on earth are wind farms actually incentivized and funded as a starting point? Sure. So there are a few different routes to market. I think the most common one that we're seeing in the UK is uh, through this contract for difference mechanism. So the CFD. Um, We're also seeing a few wind farms going to market on uh, power purchase agreements, so PPAs. And then a few of them are going to market on a purely merchant basis. So no, no sort of support required. But let me go back to the CFDs, because I guess that's the slightly more uh, complex one to understand. Mm. What are CFDs effectively? Um, the first thing to say is um, they're a support mechanism, uh, a mechanism to ensure that you have some predictability of the revenue that you're going to get. You mentioned the point around the capex, the upfront investment being uh, really high, uh, but then actually the cost of operating the wind farm are considerably lower over the uh, if its lifetime. So effectively, what this mechanism is doing is telling investors, OK, you're safe to put up this capital and invest up front because you know what kind of revenue you're going to get uh, over the course of the 15 years that this contract is in place. So the CFD is this 15 year contract be- between a low carbon electricity generator and uh, the low carbon contracts company, which is a government owned company. Uh, we in the UK have yearly auctions uh, in, as part of the CFD that set a price for the electricity uh, generated. So this is called the strike price that generators will receive for each unit of output over the course of the 15 years that the contract is in place for. Basically, when these reference prices are below the strike prices, uh, the generator will receive the difference from uh, the government owned company. But when the reference prices are above the strike prices, which is what we've seen during the energy crisis, the generator actually pays back money to the government owned company. And this money is then uh, passed on to, to bill payers. So one of the things that I always talk about is CFDs are not a subsidy. Uh, in the case of a, a, a subsidy, the money only flows one way from government to the recipient. This is not your traditional subsidy because actually money can flow both ways. And as I've mentioned, in the energy crisis, we actually had money paid back through the CFD. So it's not just a mechanism to insulate generators from this price volatility that we're seeing in the market. It's also a good way to protect consumers and ensure that they're not overpaying when uh, wholesale prices are really volatile. Okay. So (laughs) I want to just check that I've understood this. So there's a contract for difference. So the government says, hey, wind farm people, we'd like you to build a wind farm. We're going to dictate a a strike price, which is a cost per megawatt hour or what have you. That sort of sets the benchmark. When a wind farm starts generating, if the cost of electricity is below that strike price, they will pay back to the government. And it would be below that strike price if we've got loads and loads of renewables on the grid at any one point in time, we're overproducing or there isn't much supply. If it goes above the strike price, i.e. there's huge demand um, or there's loads and loads of, hmm, no, huge demand, or it's like a particularly congested grid, in that instance, the wind farm generator would pay to the government. So as you mentioned, it isn't just a subsidy from government because in that instance, money goes from government to the generator to make sure that they've got that assurance of, of revenue, that their their wind farm will be profitable. But in this instance, actually, the wind farm generator can pay the government. And so in that instance, there is a benefit to be gained by the government when the cost of electricity is above the strike price and the price is then being dictated significantly by the cost of oil and gas. And because of that, 
then there's no incentive or seemingly no incentive for the government to get an entirely renewable grid where the cost of electricity is pretty low because it doesn't stand to benefit. And then I suppose the other kind of weird thing is that the uh, the low carbon contract organisation, which pays the generators if we go below the strike price, part of that is funded by oil and gas companies. So they're not going to be particularly happy by having loads of renewables on the grid because they're having to pay the generators when that happens. So you've kind of got this bind or this sort of weird dynamic where a wind farm wants that assurance, sure, that they're going to be profitable and they need that kind of minimum amount per megawatt hour that they get that guarantee but at the same time it binds them into this tie with oil and gas and I guess to kind of unpick that we kind of need to talk about a how do we determine that strike price and b marginal pricing (laughs) which I'm totally going to leave to you but first of all that strike price Mm -hmm. when these contract for difference or these auctions are first established how is that strike price determined and does it ever become problematic? Yeah, so I think in, in terms of the quandary that you've described there, in terms of the incentives for, for government and getting that, that money paid back into them, I should say that actually there's a lot of uh, consideration being given to how these parameters uh, for the auction are set year on year. So, you know, you're actually quite unlikely to have a situation, unless you have extreme wholesale price volatility, you're unlikely to have a situation where it's just the government that ends up paying loads and loads of money to generators or the other way around, generators paying loads and loads of money to government. Effectively, what the scheme does and the beauty of it is that it insulates each party from having to pay loads and loads. So it gives that predictability. And without going into all the geeky details of the auction dynamics, it's it's fine-tuned pretty well to ensure that nobody's losing out uh, massively. In terms of how the strike price is determined, so um, I'm going to get a bit technical here, but... uh, Effectively, you have the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero uh, that looks at the data, giving an estimate of the project lifetime cash flow. Uh, so this happens before each auction. You look at what's the cash flow, if you include construction, if you include development, operational costs, decommissioning, all that kind of stuff. And then you calculate the net present value of that lifetime cash flow and set the strike price at the level at which that net present value uh, of the project's lifetime costs and revenues is equal to zero. So again, it's kind of a way to ensure that you're not profiteering or you're not losing loads of money um, in in the way that the auction is set. Um, And again, this is revised year on year. I think government are usually quite conservative in, in the way that they set the strike price to ensure, again, that those payments are minimized. We might talk about this later, but I think it it doesn't necessarily work uh, really well all the time because it means that you could actually bring more capacity if if government was a bit less conservative about those strike prices. So effectively, with the same budget available for each auction, you could just buy more gigawatts. Um, But that's a separate discussion. I think, uh, yeah, and the the thing worth remembering is the auction dynamics are pretty fine tuned. And because we've been doing this for a while now, we have a lot of experience to ensure that there's a good balance between payments received and payments outgoing. Mm. See, this is interesting because I feel like in my (laughs) extremely reductive way that I've described it, in trying to understand it, I drew it as a graph in like a very sort of sinusoidal, like Mm. they get money, we get money. And I suppose that's, you know, if people like me are Googling this information, that's maybe the assumption that you jump to. And actually hearing you describe it, you're like, okay, it is, I am much more reassured that it is a slightly more fine-tuned balancing such that no party is significantly, you know, winning or losing at any point in time. Um, But in terms of strike price, so let me just check I've got that correct. So determining that kind of, you know, that benchmark of price per megawatt hour, that's a combination of looking at the total cost of a project, the total cost over its whole lifetime, I assume sort of building it, operating it, decommissioning it, as you said, Um, and then projecting that out into the future and then coming back and saying, okay, this is the amount that we think that it is. But in terms of that conservative value and how that impacts the amount of capacity that could be available, what, that's something that I'm not sure I I understand. Could you tell us what you mean? Effectively, because the payment that you get or the payment that you have to give to to the, the government owed company is that difference between the strike price and the reference price um the bigger the difference the more you have to pay right or vice versa um so effectively what that means is that if you set a set budget for an auction so for this upcoming auction this year we have 800 million pounds for for offshore wind um 
if that difference between the strike price and the reference price is is greater, then that means you're able to purchase fewer gigawatts. Uh, it's fewer projects that you can support through the mechanism. And actually, if the difference was much smaller and you need to, you needed to make fewer payments, in total, you could support more projects through uh, with the same budget through the same auction. So, yeah, I think that's the that's the key thing uh, in terms of how conservative government has been in the past. You know, it's a tiny uh, d- detail on the auction mechanics, but I think because we're now moving into a way more competitive market, I think there's merit in thinking about actually, are we setting these strike prices at the right level? It's really right that the government was overly cautious at the beginning. And I think particularly in the first few auctions, you have that element of price discovery. Uh, you probably have a bit less competition in the market because it's a new industry. But actually, there's been quite a few years since uh, we've been doing this now. And by its very nature, you have more competition in the market. Uh, we have way, way more players. Um, there's that really big competitive tension that happens anyway. So you're guaranteed to get a pretty good price. And the risk of gaming the system is really, really low, um, especially given all the other uh, guardrails that are in place. So that's why I made the point around being conservative on the strike prices, because you have that competition, you can afford to be a bit less conservative. And given the point I made earlier around the supply chain and having large volumes deployed at each auction, there's merit that fine tuning those, uh, those dynamics in the auction to make sure that we can procure as much as possible. That is so interesting, because what it's really saying is that actually you know, we know the technology exists, we've seen it develop, but actually it hasn't necessarily been met by the same appetite for risk and recalibrating what that means with regards to pricing dynamics. Um, And that leads me to my next question, because there was an auction last year where there was a bit of a hoo-ha and it didn't necessarily go to plan. Why was that? And is that to do with that strike price? Yeah. So again, if we think about all the auction parameters that we've talked about so far, um, government really sets out the rules within which it can bid. It tells you what the maximum price that you can bid at is. It tells you all these strike prices and the total budget and everything. And effectively, what we saw last year is an auction where the parameters had not kept pace with the changing market realities. The auction prior to to that one, the, uh, so prior to the unsuccessful one, we had an option an auction that saw a real drop in prices. So we had offshore wind contracts being given for about thirty seven pounds per megawatt hour. Wow. A lot of people were saying that actually those prices were really unsustainably low because you had no lack of head headroom. And what happened the following year is effectively you really needed that headroom because interest rates went up. Uh, you had all the the volatility in uh, wholesale markets. Uh, you had cost of capital going up, interest rates, etc. So that lack of headroom became really apparent. But actually what then happened with, with that auction was there was probably an assumption from government saying, well, if we were able to award these contracts at £37 per megawatt hour, we should probably try to get the same sort of price uh, the following year because we, you've got that downward uh, curve of prices going down. But actually, that was really unrealistic, given everything that that was happening in the market. Uh, given all the disruptions, there's no way that those prices could have been replicated. And as I said, I don't think it was even desirable because you had that lack of insulation around volatility. So then offshore wind generators, which is you know the, the only technology that didn't bid in at all, that they quickly realized that, you know, actually, I'm entering this 15 year contract. It's supposed to insulate me from market volatility. But actually, what would happen at these low parameters it would lock me into a contract that would be loss making. So what's the point? Mm -hmm. Uh, And even if you assume that, oh, okay, but the contract is in place for 15 years, you've got time for prices to recover. Maybe, but actually given that uh, the focus was on getting these prices really low, it's quite unlikely that even in the near future, we're going to have the market that quickly goes back to pre-2020 levels. Uh, We still haven't seen uh, interest rates going back to previous uh, pre-2020 levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, Inflation's still up, you know, it's, probably going down a little bit, but not massively. So you still can expect volatility in the market to to persist for the next few years. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) this is where I almost have to remind myself that I'm doing a podcast because I could just listen to you chat all day and I'm like, oh no, I need to ask the next question. Um, But in terms of, okay, we've got strike price, that's kind of dictated by the overall cost, as we said, over the lifetime. And then the reference price, that's where we come back to gas. And this is all to do with marginal pricing, which, of course, I had some, you know, economics for dummies <laughs> kind of Googling here. But from what I understand is that in terms of determining that reference price, or at least sort of, you know, the wholesale price of electricity, you have a lineup system. 
in which you line up the cheapest amount of electricity first and say that's let's say that's wind in this instance and that is at low cost and if that met all of the electricity needs in the UK we would determine that that would be the price and then you go up to the next source of cleanest energy let's say it's nuclear in this instance and that's a little bit more expensive and that little bit more expensive price that determines the overall wholesale price and then when we need some gas which is last in the queue that's when the price the wholesale price is dictated by gas but the issue is is that it's dictated by gas if we're using a little of it or if we're using loads of it so even if we're using a tiny little slither suddenly our cost is dictated by gas. Um, And that's what happens kind of 98% of the time. So, you know, we mentioned that today there was the news that um, in order to, and for those listening, I'm doing quotation marks, to keep the lights on, we need new gas plants. Um, And if we have new gas plants, that means that the frequencies of those instances where we're dictating the price of wind with gas, they increase. And that seems crazy to me because presumably, and presumably organizations like yourself have done the modeling on this, with the right combination of storage technologies, the right amount of wind, the right amount of solar, we shouldn't necessarily have that, you know, reliance on gas. And we shouldn't be forced to have our pricing mechanisms dictated by gas either. So what's your kind of interpretation on that? And is there a way that we can ever decouple the cost of renewables from the cost of gas? Yeah, so let me let me just start by talking a little bit about the announcements that we've seen today on on the need for new gas to, as you say, quotation marks, keep the lights on. I think this is an area that suffers from lack of nuance in, in public debate, because on the one hand, you say you have people like some people in government who might say, oh, without gas, the lights will go off and uh, we, there's no way we can maintain the system. On the other hand, you might have people who are exactly going exactly the opposite direction and say, well, we could get, get rid of gas tomorrow. It's fine. We've got loads of renewables. The reality right now is that we're somewhere in the middle. We're in a bit of a gray zone. It is the energy transition, right? So you're at a point where, yes, you have days where all your demand is serviced by by renewables. And especially in the winter, you've got loads of wind. Um, but actually, you know, we still need gas on the system today. We might not do in the future. Uh, we might you know, replace it with nuclear or whatever. Uh, but the reality is that we still need some of it today. What the problem I have with today's announcements is that they talk about building new gas fired power plants uh, to keep these lights on. Yes, we need gas. Do we necessarily need to be to build new gas plants? I don't think so. Um, the capacity that we have today needs to be uh, maintained properly. Yes, definitely. But there is a cheaper option where you could actually just extend the lifetime of the gas uh, fired power plants that you have on the system today. And that's perfectly possible. It's cheaper. And it still gives the right signals in terms of, yes, we're still aiming for net zero and we're still aiming to decarbonize our power system. But what you end up following the the announcements today that government is going to be consulting on is a bit of a halfway house where you say, yes, we definitely need gas, but we're not really rolling back on any of the targets. So we're expecting you investors to come up with all this money to build new gas uh, gas power uh, plants. But we don't know how much longer you're going to have a revenue stream for because we're still decarbonizing everything by 2035, right? So it's a bit of a bind. And I think the the market signal that the government is hoping to convey isn't really that strong. And it's leaving a few people quite confused. Um, mm. So that's just a, a little commentary on, on what's happening today. But in terms of, let me just get back to the point around marginal pricing, because I always find it interesting how much attention this is getting in, in electricity uh, markets and in energy. But I think it's actually such a common thing, right? We have marginal pricing pretty much everywhere in the economy. So the reason you pay more for last minute airplane tickets is because of marginal pricing. The reason you can buy a winter coat for cheaper in the summer is because of marginal pricing. So effectively, it's it's a fairly common economic principle that enables you to manage surges, surges in demand, to make a profit when demand is low, uh, to manage market liquidity. Um, and I think if you got rid of that, you couldn't really have a functioning market. A few reasons for that. So if in electricity markets, let's say we get rid of marginal pricing tomorrow, you have a big question mark of how do you actually pay for the other forms of generation, which are more expensive than wind, but you still need on the system today to keep the lights on. So, you know, we talked about gas. Yes, we need gas today. But if in 20 years we don't need gas, we probably will need some other form of baseload, right? So either that's uh, long duration energy storage, 
or it's green hydrogen or it's nuclear. All of these technologies would be more expensive than wind generation, but you still need them on the system. And if you get rid of marginal pricing and this merit order effect that you described at the beginning, then there's no way to guarantee a revenue stream for them. You have some other markets that you can bid into, so such as the capacity market, which effectively looks at how you get the capacity to keep the lights on and keep the system reliable. But again, that's not that's not a significant chunk of revenue that would enable you to cover your capex and your operational mm-hmm. costs. So this is why we still need marginal pricing. And you know, as frustrating as it is that you can't get that price of wind directly passed on to consumers, it's going to be really difficult to engineer a system that moves away from that principle. Mm-hmm. However, I think, you know, we've talked about the CFDs. That's effectively a way of decoupling those gas from electricity prices. So the more capacity we bring on to CFDs, the better. And I've also mentioned at the beginning power purchase agreements. Again, for businesses, energy intensive users, that's a great way of bypassing the cost of gas because you can strike a deal directly with the renewable energy generator and you get much lower prices. So Amazon Web Services uh, signed the PPA recently. We have all these breweries and distilleries that are doing the same. So there are other ways of doing it, which don't require unpicking the whole market. But then, okay, and again, lovely listeners and viewers of this podcast, what you're witnessing here is my kind of, (laughs) again, I said, uh, ploy to better understand energy economics. So again, this could be a very, very naive question, but with marginal pricing, part of that supply and demand is attached to like a physical commodity, which if you have something like wind and solar, and I'm I'm being really reductive here because I'm ignoring nuclear for a moment, but let's say we've got wind and solar and storage on our grid. It's not a commodity and it's not a kind of supply and demand. It's not a commodity that's exposed to supply and demand economics in the same way. It's something to be managed and just move its position either through generation where it's stored or where it's going to consumers Mm -hmm. and that feels like whilst yes we probably do need marginal pricing it is a thing it is an entity that doesn't doesn't subscribe to the same commodity dynamics perhaps that's right and you know i think um if you're for example if you're the um national grid eso and you're uh, in the control room you're trying to keep the lights on Imagine you didn't have any gas on the system for a minute. So let's say we're in 2050, you know, we've decarbonized everything and somehow we also managed to get rid of all the gas. You would still need to look at, okay, how much generation do I need to meet my demand? Imagine it's, you know, 6 p.m., everyone's coming back from work, putting the kettle on. You're going to need quite a lot. Maybe you're going to be able to meet, say, 90% of it from wind, but you still will need that residual 10% to be met by some other uh, some other form of generation. If we don't have gas that could come from, as I mentioned, storage, it could come from interconnectors. You know, maybe we're exporting, uh, maybe we're importing um, hydro from Norway, uh, for example, or, you know, maybe it comes from uh, from green hydrogen generation. But again, I think if, if we compare some of those technologies and the prices that we're seeing, they are less mature than offshore wind, for example, mm-hmm. or onshore wind or solar. So again, the price is likely to be a bit higher. And again, you're going to observe the same same merit order effect, same marginal pricing principle, because what's going to set the price of your electricity is going to be that last technology that you bring online to meet 100% of your demand. So I suppose what we can really do in that situation is make sure that that last base load demand, that's the thing that we're like, right, we know that winds come down. We know that solar has come down in price. We know that storage technology is coming down in price. We need to give the same attention to whatever that base load is, whether that is storage, whether it's nuclear, hopefully it's not gas, but maybe it is with a bit of carbon capture, hopefully. But that price is given the same consideration and bringing that down. Exactly. That's exactly right. And I think um, one of the other things that is getting a bit lost in the news cycle today. Uh, this consultation that we've mentioned that looks at uh, gas-fired power plants and different types of market pricing is actually also looking at how do we bring online technologies like long duration storage? Mm. How do we incentivize that? How do we enable the cost to come down as they have for wind, right? So they might not be at the price of wind, but we can still see that uh, that downward curve in terms of costs. Mm. And I think the other thing we haven't touched on is the fact that we can also look at demand side flexibility. So yeah. you have a lot of consumers that are already on on some of those flexible tariffs. So uh, you know if you do your washing um, in at, in the middle of the day, or if you charge your EV at, at night, then you get a discounted price for your electricity. Uh, and 
actually the demand side is way more responsive to that kind of stuff and those incentives than uh, maybe politicians assume. So that's really a lever that we haven't really touched that much, but mm-hmm. it's really doing because, again, it's going to reduce that exposure to the most expensive bit of technology that you need to service demand. And I suppose not just demand side flexibility, but also let's assume that a big proportion of people have solar and home battery in 20 years time or what have you, or there's greater instances of um, distributed energy resources and community wind farm, solar, etc. Those things become, again, even more nuanced as well. And I can also most imagine, like, say I was a politician and being briefed by, you know, someone on the future of energy. And then you just keep adding these components. You're like, oh, I get it. And then another thing's added. You're like, I don't get it. This is really complicated and I'm a bit stressed. So I can, it's very easy to see how the nuance gets diluted in the the rhetoric and the news and all that kind of thing um and then you get people like me asking stupid questions on podcasts but trying to understand it <laughs> it's really important to ask those questions because as you say all of this stuff can get lost in the news cycle and you know we're just focusing on the big headlines but actually you know it is a really difficult exercise it's the way i think about it is kind of like you're driving the car and you're building it at the same time because mm. we don't know we have predictions on what the, the system is going to look like in 2050 but a lot of that will re- depend on how consumers respond, uh, how technology evolves, how uh, what the cost profile is going to be. So it's something that we, requires us to keep thinking about this and, and asking the right questions. So that does lead me on to my next question, because if let's say for imagine that we've got, you know, 20 is the year is 2030. We have the 50 gigawatts of capacity and we're going to start to see those 15 year contracts run out. Some will have already run out. So. In that instance, you'd have hoped that some of that capex would have been recouped and those wind farms are just looking at costs that they can get from generation. They're like kind of um, operating costs. In that instance, things get a little bit wibbly, presumably. What's your kind of view of what happens when those contracts run out? Yeah, so um, I think if the year is 2030, we have loads of contracts running out, presumably you have loads of of capacity on on the system. And... The, the phenomenon that you described is usually known as price cannibalization. So effectively, you have loads of wind. Um, all the turbines are generating at the same time. There's a lot of capacity, but there's not enough demand. So say maybe it's a time when people are at work and the demand is a bit lower. Mm-hmm. Then effectively, the prices uh, could go to zero uh, or they could even go negative because you have oversupply, lack of demand. This is something that the consultation that's come out today is effectively looking at. And I think, you know, it's a question that it's right that we're asking it now because we're getting closer to that point where the contracts will be running out. We could be seeing loads of capacity, prices going negative. So the question for me is about, well, what do you do with that capacity and how do you find a different revenue stream? Because, yes, you can get it by selling it to the grid uh, and and you put it in the wholesale market. Uh, but actually, you know, if we develop the bigger system that we talked about with storage, with better interconnection, um, with high, green hydrogen, uh, then you can have different types of uh, different ways of channeling that surplus capacity. So, for example, uh, it's 2030. You have loads of, uh, of wind generating at, at any given time. That surplus capacity currently gets wasted because the grid is inadequate and we don't have that integrated system um, the, the way that it should be. But in 2030, what could happen is, OK, you actually, we're actually uh, having a lot of green hydrogen production across the country. You can use green hydrogen as a way of, of storing your excess energy so you can make some some money that way. Or you could actually um, convert your electricity to green hydrogen and then you use green hydrogen for applications in sectors that are really hard to electrify. So if you look at a sector like steel, yes, you can electrify parts of it if you're looking at how to recycle scrap steel, but actually primary steel making, you can't really electrify. It's going to require really high temperatures. And in order to uh, decarbonize the processes that you're seeing today, one very feasible option is to rely on on green hydrogen uh, in order to decarbonize steel making. It's the same with ammonia. It's the same with long distance transport. So the demand side will be there if we're thinking about all these different levers. There will be demand for for excess power. It's just about how we channel it in the right way and how we enable those uh, generators to make a revenue. So I feel like you've painted it, you've very, very clearly laid out what mechanisms exist today, how they may need to evolve in the future, the different sort of things that we need to think about. And at the same time, I know that you probably have a lot of battles every day, some small, some larger, some immediate, some further out into the future. 
So if you could, you know, wave your magic wand and get rid of all of the things that are in your way uh, to making this a reality, what would some of those really big hitters be? And what would some of the things you'd wish for be? Yeah, so oh, it's really hard to pick just one, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give you a, a, a short list of, of things that I've, I'd use if I had a magic wand. I think the first one is uh, just building the grid in time. Um, that's really one of the biggest blockers to getting the system that we want. We don't have enough transmission capacity, which means that we're wasting cheap power that's being generated. Uh, because we don't have adequate capacity, it also takes absolutely ages, even more than 10 years for some projects to connect to the grid uh, and actually start giving that power to the wholesale market. So there are a lot of conversations happening today. There are some reforms ongoing, uh, but I'm really conscious that all of that takes time. And because I've mentioned the general election, there's always a potential for delay. So if I could wave a magic wand, I'd really accelerate that and ensure that we have the right grid tomorrow, because that's just going to lead to a way more efficient, cheaper system. Maybe the other thing um, is about the supply chain. Um, Again, I've mentioned that we really need to scale it up. And it's not just because we want to create jobs in the UK and we want to create those employment opportunities in the supply chain, but it's actually because we won't be able to meet our targets if we don't have the right supply chain. And if we invest ahead of time and if we're smart about it, we also create a lot of export opportunities for the UK. So I've mentioned areas of competitive advantage, services, uh, electrical systems, blades, uh, cables, all of that, there's a really big market uh, out there in the world for uh, for all of these components and services. So if we get ahead of the game, we've got ourselves a really good export opportunity. The final thing I uh, I would fix if I could wave my magic wand is um, probably just fixing this whole deluge of disinformation that's um, mm-hmm. surrounding the energy transition. And you know, we talked about how things get oversimplified and the detail gets lost. I think we've seen a lot of that in the media following that infamous Uxbridge by-election where the prime minister came out afterwards and said, don't worry, you're not going to have to do seven recycling bins and give up your car and your burgers. And I think that really gave uh, a lot of airtime to some really Mm. dodgy narratives that are taking hold on social media. And I think that's really not helping anyone because it's, it's not portraying the facts of the energy transition. It's creating a false impression about the sector is out to get you or something like that. Um, and I think it's it's really going to take us that much longer to to build the grid, to get the communities to host that infrastructure on behalf of the nation. And I'm very acutely aware that, you know, there's a general election coming up. You need to draw the political battle line somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I'm just hoping it's not going to be here. God, that is such an interesting list. And I think it's really exposed some of the things that we haven't had a chance to speak about today, such as floating wind, onshore wind and how we can accelerate that different forms of renewable energy hard to decarbonize sectors there are so many things that i think we really need to follow up with um additional episodes but the point on misinformation and disinformation i think we've seen some of that even in this discussion the things that i as a reasonably informed person have still oversimplified and had to you know bring my questions and ignorance to this conversation but that's so important i think that's why hopefully platforms like the Fully Charged Show podcast and our episodes are important to kind of help encourage the debate and pick through the facts and and distinguish fact from fiction. Um, It's very evident to me that you are extremely knowledgeable and extremely passionate. I'm intrigued to know what brought you to your work in Renewable UK and what kind of specifically motivates you on a personal level. Yeah, sure. So I I think it's always tempting when you reflect on your career journey to think this was always meant to be. The path was always taking me here. But I think the the reality is that I was quite, quite undecided about what I wanted to do. So at university, I did uh, philosophy and and politics. So effectively, what I knew is I want to do something that's intellectually stimulating um, and has a positive impact on the world. And I also do enjoy a bit of political gossip. So if I can get a job (laughs) that has all those elements, that would be fantastic. I didn't always want to work in renewables, but actually when when the opportunity came about, uh, it, it was clearly that I was ticking all of those boxes. And in previous roles in different organizations that I've worked in, I was lucky enough to really be at the interface between government and a range of different sectors that were either looking to, uh, to decarbonize, uh, increase productivity, all the sorts of challenges that are, uh, are still really relevant in, in the economy today. So I looked at sectors like you know defense, construction, uh, road transport, all that kind of stuff, heavy industry. But I think it clearly became really evident to me that if we don't have the right energy mix, if we don't have uh, that zero carbon electricity coming onto the grid in uh, in a low cost way, 
all of this is a bit pointless because we're not going to unlock the productivity that we need. Uh, we're not going to decarbonize all those other sectors that depend on electrification. So I think that's something that really motivates me because we need to be uh, the first ones moving, the, the first ones achieving net zero in order to then trigger that whole cross economy uh, decarbonization. So it's it's really something that keeps me going, although it is quite challenging at times. And um, I think especially now I, I keep mentioning the election, but I think we're just in for a very rocky year um, mm. and also for, for next year, if you're considering everything that needs to happen, all the stuff that we've talked about today. And, you know, that's that's just part of it. Right. Um, mm. It's quite a big challenge. And I think just keeping everyone aligned and ensuring that uh, the pace of delivery doesn't drop is really important. That is so interesting. And I do think that we are at this incredibly interesting time where the technology exists. We've said that earlier on in this podcast. We know that they will get better, but actually everything else is around the philosophical conversations, the political conversations, the economic mechanisms that exist as well. And that's, it is going to be a challenging year. Um, so I think probably aided by one or two GNTs um, and some real stamina. <laughs> Um, Anna, thank you so much for your insights uh, today, especially when I know it's a, an extremely, extremely busy day and for answering all of my questions. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I hope we can continue this conversation um, in the future as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Majel. It's been a pleasure. That is all that we have time for today. Thank you so much to Anna for taking the time to speak with us and share her incredible insights and wisdom. I think it's really exposed just how much nuance there is in this discussion and how there is always room to continue learning and debating and discussing and it's certainly given us food for thought for future episodes again let us know what you think in the comments as well but thank you lovely listeners and viewers for joining us um if i could ask just one tiny favor before you go if you could take the time to give this a little like a comment or a subscribe or all of the above it is enormously appreciated it makes sure that we can keep sharing the important and cool stuff in this clean energy transition so that's it if you have been, thank you for listening.